et bienvenue à cette première conférence de notre série Hiver 2024, portant sur l'innovation en santé, présentée par la Direction des affaires universitaires, enseignement et recherche du Cius de l'Ouest de l'île de Montréal. Pour votre information, la conférence sera enregistrée et mise à votre disposition pour visionnement futur sur la page web de notre établissement. Je me présente, Sylvain Charbonneau, chef du transfert des connaissances et innovations. Je tiens à vous remercier sincèrement pour votre présence à cette conférence. À titre d'information, nous avions ce matin plus de 80 inscriptions là, au webinaire euh, d'aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, une représentation de 14 établissements, là, puis environ quatre universités là, qui, sont, euh, qui, sont, donc, qui sont représentées dans l'auditoire aujourd'hui. Merci à tous ceux et celles qui, qui sont présents et, et merci de contribuer au rayonnement là, de, ces, de ces webinaires. C'est grâce à vous et également aux conférenciers et conférencières là, qui acceptent si gentiment de participer à ces conférences euh, que ces activités de transfert des connaissances sont un succès. Nous constatons que l'intérêt pour ce type d'événement est bien présent et nous incite à poursuivre évidemment nos efforts en ce sens. Ces conférences sont rendues possibles grâce à l'appui du Cius de l'Ouest de l'Île de Montréal, du Centre de recherche de l'Hôpital Douglas, de la Direction des affaires universitaires enseignement recherche et de l'unité de transfert des connaissances synaptiques. J'en profite d'ailleurs pour remercier toutes les personnes qui ont participé à la réalisation et à la mise en œuvre de cette conférence. La conférence d'aujourd'hui aura pour titre « Application du modèle de soins Dialogue Plus » pour les patients, les patients oui, psychiatriques ambulatoires souffrant de troubles mentaux graves en combinaison avec la budgétisation des programmes et l'analyse marginale. Pour la conférence aujourd'hui, nous avons l'honneur oui, de recevoir M. Éric Latimer, professeur du département de psychiatrie de l'Université McGill et chercheur au Centre de recherche Douglas, économiste de la santé de formation. Ses recherches se sont concentrées sur les pratiques fondées sur les données probantes pour les personnes atteintes de maladies graves. Madame Manuela Ferrari, euh, donc on attend toujours son arrivée, je crois, mais Madame Manuela Ferrari a peut-être eu un empêchement, mais devrait se joindre à nous euh, sous peu. Professeure adjointe au département de psychiatrie de l'Université McGill et chercheuse au Centre de recherche Douglas également. Ses recherches se concentrent sur la conception participative aux interventions de santé mentale en ligne afin d'améliorer l'accès aux soins, le traitement et l'engagement des clients à l'égard des services. Donc, merci à nos conférenciers conférencières. La conférence d'aujourd'hui sera tenue en anglais. Donc, euh, voilà. Donc, sans plus tarder, je passerai la parole à euh, nos conférenciers. Donc, M. Latimer et Mme Manuela Ferrari. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, merci beaucoup d'être ici euh, aujourd'hui. Euh, J'ai juste un petit problème technique à régler, c'est-à-dire comment euh, ça fonctionne. Voilà. Donc, euh, tout d'abord, euh, je veux. I'm actually going to switch to English. I know there's at least one person here who is an anglophone. My own slides will be in French. Mes propres diapos seront en français. Uh, Manuela's will be in English. Um, I want to, and I also want to say, I understand Manuela's not here yet. Manuela, if you, if you're hearing this, <laughs> let me know that you're here. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to say is that this project uh, has been given a name, which we called it Maps for Mesurer, Améliorer, Prioriser, Measure, Improve, Prioritize, Le Point Santé. Uh, I want to begin with acknowledgements. Uh, besides Manuela, Craig Mitten at UBC and Rida, Dr. Rida Joubert uh, were co-PIs. Uh, also, uh, David Blue, Martin Lepage, Jay Shaw, Mira Piat were co-investigators. Um, a number of Students and staff participated in this, in this project. Vicky Ann Claveau did an early precursor project for this. Haley Baird was the coordinator for a long time. Wenny Fan helped, and Judith Sabetti did the analysis of transcripts. I want to mention too that uh, I relied quite a bit, uh, and I have to admit this was the first time in my career I did this. Uh, I relied quite a bit on the panel of service users whom I'm naming here. I think a couple of them are on now. Uh, and I must say it was a very happy experience, I think for them as well as 
for myself, and it was really very helpful to do that, and I wish I'd started that practice much sooner. Uh, funding came from Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives, uh, and also uh, an amount from HBHL originally that Dr. Martin Lepage was willing to grant to this. So uh, a little bit on measurement-based care. Uh, so it has been defined as uh, the use of validated clinical measurement instruments to objectify the uh, assessment treatment. Okay, I, sorry, I'm seeing that Manuel is not sure. She has the right invitation to join the meeting. Could I maybe ask the staff of Synaptic to resend the link? So I will continue uh, presenting what are actually uh, uh, her slides. So, um, so measurement-based care consists in using uh, a clinical measurement in instrument to objectify the assessment treatment and clinical outcomes of a treatment, which can be with psychiatric disorders or more generally people with health issues, for example, uh, adjusting blood pressure medication according to blood pressure readings is a simple form, a, a very common form of measurement-based care. It's been done much less often in the context of the treatment of people with psychotic disorders. So, um, so this tool, Dialogue, Dialogue Plus, uh, Dialogue was originally uh, a, an instrument to measure quality of life of individuals with mental illness, particularly those experiencing psychosis. Uh, it was evaluated using an RCT uh, involving more than 500 patients in six European countries. Uh, quality of life was improved, treatment satisfaction was improved, but with a small effect size. Um, so simply measuring quality of life proved to be insufficient. Uh, and this is what led to Dialogue Plus. So, uh, so as you can see, this is not new work. Uh, Stefan Priba in England uh, led the team that developed this tool um, almost, well, it was, it was ongoing 20 years ago. Uh, Dialogue Plus uh, goes beyond just the, the, the measurement to a structured way of doing the conversation between the case manager and the client. So there are 11 questions uh, that pertain to eight domains of quality of life and three domains having to do with services. So um, mental health, physical health, job situation, accommodation, leisure activities, partner family, friendships, personal safety, and then three domains related to the services received. So it's the patient experience of care, medication, practical health, and meetings. So when the tool is applied, uh, a tablet is used and the client gets to see uh, their ratings uh, on here on January the 6th, 2020, and which is a, a prior date. Uh, and uh, the current assessment, which is in blue. So they can see, for example, that in terms of mental health, their satisfaction went up from two to four since the previous assessment. Um, so the steps in the structured discussion uh, go this way. Step one is understanding why, why is a rating high but not lower? Uh, what's working, but also in the case of ratings that are lower, you know, why is the rating low? What's the problem? So then we look forward. So um, what, what could we do that uh, would improve your rating on this domain? So, and this is divided between the patient, the clinician, and what can others do? And then a plan is formulated. So, so we're we're inquiring about how the person feels about eleven different parts of their life. Uh, we identify the areas where there's uh, a, the person is not satisfied, uh, 
And then we try to find for those areas where the person also says they would like help. That's an, another question to ask. Uh, what can be done to uh, help them to um, to improve their score on that? So it's an open access tool. It's low cost digital intervention. Uh, it's evidence based. It's been tried in 18 countries, several trials recommended by clinical guidelines, short and flexible to implement uh, in as many as three successive sessions. Uh, the evidence suggests are sufficient to uh, show uh, positive outcomes. So it empowers providers um, and also clients. Uh, and indeed, we won't show you this slide, but one of the papers indicates that um, the use of Dialog Plus leads clients to do more for themselves. So it's it, it can actually be win-win for case managers and clients. So a number of studies have been done on this. I won't take the time to go over go over all those results, um, but you can just quickly glance at at this. So you can see that kind of research continues to be carried out and even in uh, a developing country setting, which shows that it's it's not a super complicated uh, tool to implement. So there is a training process for it, a short explanatory video, a manual, an adherence scale to, to ensure that it's being implemented properly. So uh, now I'm going to switch and I'm hoping that Manuela has been able to join. Um, so, uh, so now I want to switch gears and talk about the other part of the project. So we were trying to do two things at once in this project, two things that are normally done separately. But the idea was that the first, the, the Dialogue Plus part, would inform the PBMA part. This was, I would say, only partially successful. We'll come to that. But now I want to explain to you that this other methodology, which is probably not familiar to you. So, uh, so the context for program budgeting and marginal analysis is that any healthcare organization of any size uh, typically will have a number of programs or services that are operating simultaneously, each with its own budgetary envelope. Um, those, so those budgetary envelopes uh, at a given point in time exist at a certain level for each program, and each is supposed to serve to, on one hand, if it's a healthcare organization, improve the health of OSC. Manuel has joined, perfect. So I'll, I'll be able to switch to Manuel when we come to the results of implementation of uh, Dialogue uh, Plus. So, um, so each envelope is meant to help improve health outcomes of different groups and also uh, realistically uh, often uh, meet various organizational objectives. And so we can ask ourselves the question, is the distribution of dollars between the different programs optimal? Uh, experience shows that usually Historical factors, political factors as well, often influence like how much money is given to different programs. And it's not necessarily going to be the case that this is going to give the best results either for the, uh, the clients or for the organization. So the fundamental question that PBMA asks is, is it possible to reallocate resources across different programs or services in order to better respond to the needs of patients and the organization. So, for example, if $100,000 are cut from one program, like how bad is the impact of that going to be on for patients and for the organization? 
If instead the hundred thousand dollars are reinvested in another program, what's going to be the benefit for patients and your organization? Will it be possible to say that actually the benefits of that transfer of funds will exceed the cost of the cut? And I think you can all see that in your personal lives, we're in our personal lives, we're constantly making that kind of trade-off, evaluating like, let's say, do I have too many subscriptions to uh, kind of Netflix, Paramount, whatever, uh, would it be better off to cut in some of those and spend more, save money for our retirement, let's say, or, or perhaps uh, donate more money to charity? So the mechanics of the approach can be described in this way. You have to set up a stakeholder committee, uh, which typically will include like the leadership of uh, whatever service your whatever not service but organization uh, is being contemplated. In our case, it was the psychotic disorders program. Um, so you want people from the leadership. You want preferably some service users, some clinicians, some managers. So a diversity of points of view uh, who are going to broadly reflect uh, the points of view of the organization and the values of the organization. Because there's obviously some value judgments that are going to be applied here. So we will uh, define what are the criteria against which we're going to evaluate investment or disinvestment proposals, um, then we're going to invite the leaders of different services or programs to submit proposals, hopefully for some for disinvestment and some for investment. Of course, the disinvestment is much less comfortable for program leaders, service leaders to propose, and we'll get back to that. And then there's an initial evaluation of the proposals by the stakeholder committee. Uh, we go back to the managers who submitted proposals and we say, well, we've looked at your proposal. We've looked at your way of assessing it. This is what we think. And then they get back to you and you finalize your decisions. You can do this over the course of a year and then repeat year after year after year. So that's the mechanics of how it's supposed to work. Now, you've probably, I'm guessing, almost nobody except those who are, were part of the project has ever heard of PBMA, uh, but it's actually uh, something that's been around for decades. Uh, you can see here uh, an article by Craig Mitten, who is a co, who's an expert in this, based at UBC. He was, uh, he he really uh, was the leader for. Uh, this part of the project, um, the, our, our, our intellectual guide. And um, so, uh, so as early as uh, around the year 2000, he published an article with Cam Donaldson, another expert in the field, uh, describing 25 years of PBMA in the health sector. Uh, and then there have been more recent articles so it's it's a well-established method that's been applied scores of times in many countries and in a number of Canadian provinces, but never yet in Quebec. So a Google search on in brackets, uh, in, in uh, not in brackets, but in uh, quotation marks, program budgeting and marginal analysis gives us over 6,000 results yesterday. Um, so the objectives of the project were to make better use of data to improve outcomes among people with psychosis. So that's the common thread between the two. Uh, so we wanted to implement measurement-based care with Dialogue Plus for patients with psychotic disorders at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. In parallel, implement PBMA in such a way that patient and clinician reported outcome and process measures inform the PBMA process, gather information concerning the perceived impacts of both MBC and PBMA on patient outcomes, as well as on organizational objectives, and identify facilitators and barriers to both. At this point, this is what we can report on. So most of it, but not the perceived impacts of the PBMA or 
its impact on organizational objectives or facilitators and barriers. So, um, so this, these are the numbers of people who participated in the implementation of Dialogue Plus. Um, there were also people in inpatient services, uh, but, uh, but that experimentation did not work very well. Um, it was just difficult to get both case managers, nurses, uh, and even more to, to line up the participation of clients in those settings. Uh, but it worked relatively well uh, with the ACT teams, with the SIV teams, intensive case management in English, and with Clinic L'Etape, which is an outpatient clinic for people with fairly severe mental disorders. So here are the results for the ACT teams uh, on the first administration with 19 individuals. So you can see uh, the two domains for which satisfaction was lowest were uh, the professional situation and physical health. Both domains were about half of participants said they would appreciate some help. And you can see in general domains where satisfaction was higher, such as meetings with the, the case manager um, or personal safety or friendships for this uh, clientele. There were not very many people or fewer people who wanted help with that domain. Uh, if we now turn to the SIV teams, uh, you can see that again, the two domains for which satisfaction is lowest are professional situation and physical health. Uh, and, and there's an even greater percentage who would like help. Um, interestingly, uh, there's fairly low satisfaction Actually, it's even lower uh, with friendships with the SIV clients. So these people don't get attention from clinicians as much uh, as ACT team clients. Now, if we turn to L'ETAP, uh, here the, the two lowest domains are physical health and professional situation. So these two domains are always among the three lowest among all the domains. Uh, and we always have at least about half of the clients who would like help with that. Um, and then did we see improvement over time? So for 42 people, we were able to compare the first administration and the last administration. There are at least two administrations. And you can see that for domains that were initially lower, where more help was offered and, and organized, uh, you do tend to see improvement uh, from the first to the last uh, administration. So now we come to uh, the qualitative phase and Manuela is going to take over. Thank you so much, Eric, and great job in uh, introducing Dalo Plus. Um, so uh, let's look over the implementation phase with some feedback from a, a case manager and a patient about the, the use of Dialoplast in clinical settings. So um, you realize this is a mixed method study, sequential. So after we collect the quantitative data, we move into uh, try to unpack the experience of using it. So um, we invited all case managers that they use Dialoplast and 6C. Uh, 16 of the key management decided to take part in a follow-up interview after the use of Dialog Plus. And um, on, of all the clients that we are exposed to uh, Dialog Plus, we were able to reach uh, 38 of them and 19 decided to actually um, take part of the interview. Um, the interview, and I will not probably give justice of the richness of the data, um, but I want to mention that to try to make sense to the experience, uh, we decided to organize the group in different, so the, the case manager and clinician and, and patient into different group. And the group were created on the use of Dialog Plus. So we do know that a minimum of three sessions with Dialog Plus can be effective. In a slide before, you probably saw that the early implementation in, uh, in Europe was done with the average of four times uh, in a, in a one-year period, and that was effective. 
to promote quality of life. So we created those groups. So you can see group one is people that use it one or two times. Group two for case manager is the one between two to three. And plus three and plus would be the desirable. And you can see how many people did it. So um, most of the people who were, you know, remember it was the pandemic was not easy, but they use it like kind of two to three times. And also we did the similar, we wanted to know what the uh, patient, where they were exposed. So um, in that case, you know, some people use it, uh, you know, you know, we have a patient uh, that actually use it less than two times, two times, and 11 actually use it more, which is the desirable. And we can move to the next slide. Thank you, Eric. So the data are organized in the following category. We talk about the feedback we receive about the training. You probably realize that the Dallo Plus training, as you saw in the other slide, is very simple. It's video, they are uh, online for people, and uh, there is a manual and an endurance kit, which was actually not used to, but very simple. So after we're gonna explore the implementation, what we know about using Dallo Plus, and we unpack some of the team connected to advanced disadvantage disadvantage of using Dello Plus according to clients and case manager. And let's see the first team about the learning experience. And please don't feel that you need to read all the quote. It's just for me to give you a sense. So as you know, in qualitative data, the, the quotes from participants are the data, the core part. So we know that the training uh, was important to master skill. Um, and uh, and in, in using the new measure and the, this new digital intervention tool, but this was not for all. So you can see that they feel uh, some people feel that it was very stressful, pretty easy to do. It was also nice to see how people they feel comfortable with able to mentor other people. But one of the things you can see in the quote in the middle that uh, the video they are online on, on YouTube uh, um, sometimes they are actually not accessible for uh, in the hospital environment, and some people need to find troubleshoot on their own, which was quite resourceful for case manager using their own phone to enter the internet. And we will come back to some of the technology issues uh, that people experience. Um, so how to improve, that's what people told us about the training, which is uh, uh, so they want to see step-by-step -step help. You know, again, we was done during the pandemic. Some of the training and meeting were all over Zoom, but having someone that knows how to troubleshoot, how to log in, how to remember my login password, and how to download the app, all of these stuff are very, very important to promote the uptake of the tools. The other thing is also like doing wrong playing, which was actually not in place in this case. I was just watching the video. And the other thing that people ask was mentorship. You know, someone, a champion that, that no, used it. And if uh, someone, maybe another case manager, can, can help uh, the implementation and gain some confidence. And I like to think the case manager that now use it can be our champion in the future. So let's talk about uh, what we know about the implementation, what people um, would they will work well in this case. So for some people we will see the user friendly, I noticed that it depends how people define that. So some people realize that it was a kind of user friendly, easy to use, straightforward. Um, something that Dialog Plus does well, which we know was kind of the aim, is promoting discussion, you know? It helps to, uh, to open up to some domain that sometimes case manager do not feel that uh, uh, they spend time on. They really love the data visualization, which is the important thing. So the fact that they insert their own data directly and see the result over time. You saw early on how data visualization look like. So it's simple, consistent, it's time effective, you know, so it doesn't interfere. And some people also say they support clinical support. So really collecting new information that can be used by the clinic. And I like to think that uh, that was very resourceful by this case manager. They actually the notes the information collected through um, the Allo Plus as a measure, but also intervention was also inserted in clinics. So um, the next phase talk about the barrier and the main barrier we kind of know, I'm sure no one is surprised here, is actually internet access, access to technology. So Dallo Plus can work very well, but I will say that in a small phone it's very, difficult to see. So tablet is even better, you know, to use it. But people have to use it sometimes. Uh, their own resources work both to access internet. So for example, using the, the own phone to be able to log in uh, and, uh, and access the platform. 
and uh, earlier right that that it can be an issue in implementation. Um, the other thing is important to recognize is also that case managers do uh, do home visit. In that case, sometimes they don't know which kind of internet is available in the place, right? So that's another important part to take into consideration. Um, so let's look uh, at the next one about what the client think about Dialoplus, what they like. So for some of them, you know, it was user friendly, uh, easy to use at every meeting. They also like the data visualization, as said before, you know, because they can see how they are doing. Another part is very interesting, which we know when we ask questions, we use technology, is the self-evaluation and the activation, I will call so. In asking the question, the person has the moment to think about themselves, how they are doing, if they are satisfied or not in some of the domain, they are very comprehensive, and, and also they can take action. You know, I like the quote, I got uh, to know myself and feel kind of better taking charge. We will see also how case managers see some of those uh, elements as well. So we have another slide after. One of the major concerns that we can see it's also like the privacy. So, and that was identified, you will see in the next slide, not, uh, not only by clients, but also by case manager. Not all the clients feel comfortable to using uh, uh, technology, but also like they are concerned about privacy and how the information are used, stored, and other. So, this is an opportunity to be literacy in uh, this, uh, on this topic. So, in the next slide, we're going to see what actually works for, according to provider. You can see some of the similarity. So again, we return on the fact that the communication piece is very important. It gives you an opportunity to explore really those areas that sometimes, uh, you know, sorry, the second part, so uh, open new dimensions. So I never uh, thought to ask some of those questions, but that plus with some of the domain allowed that to do. Uh, you know, the communication is easy. It's, uh, is into this kind of interview with the people like uh, can unpack and people can find uh, case manager an opportunity to open up uh, and uh, ask uh, and discuss some topics with the clients. And the last part that you can see, which I think is quite uh, in, uh, powerful, is empower a client. I really love those quotes because I see how the tool really, the person uh, take charge of the meeting, which is actually very important. Um, and you can see really, uh, uh, how the term, uh, like uh, the case measure, they felt that the, there is this way of empowering the clients to really see what is important to them and to work on what is important to them. I love that in the second, in the last quote that you can see, you say that they uh, take the driving seat, right? So it's quite a powerful as a metaphor. Um, in the next slide, we probably, so there are also other two aspects that are very important. Is, you know, in something that can be very abstract, the fact that Dialopass has for a score, it, create, it provides a tangible value of their experience, something that can work. And part of the strategy in Dialopass is really say, okay, this is uh, this number of satisfaction. You know, it can be a six instead of a four. What makes that a six or vice versa, according to whatever is the question or whatever people are working? And building new relationship and understanding, okay? Uh, you know, um, that I think is quite um, important in, uh, in uh, new opportunity, really, that Dialoplus was opening for provider. Um, in the next slide, we see what uh, um, there were some of the issues, which I think is covered. You can see some of the similarity between the experience of the, of the patient, but also in, in the provider. So um, I'm going to leave the first one. I love to say we have technology, you know, uh, um, Chris many recognize that not all people are comfortable using technology. There may be some problem in scheduling, you know, if something changes and needs a follow up and they're supposed to do uh, the second appointment or session off. So there can be some issues connecting to. The, the details here are kind of mixed. One why I like this institutionalization last is kind of the one that probably is something to reflect on of Dallas Plus work very well in settings that are recovery oriented. And some of the what provider provides the feedback is they feel that it may not be the tool for everyone. And unfortunately, people they may be more deprived of experience um, uh, institutionalization. Uh, may have difficulties uh, of finding a new uh, solution or engaging with the tool. Uh, so uh, I think I have one more slide. 
coming up. We can review take home messages. So definitely on the training, we know that we can support by step-by-step -step information, practices section, and mentorship can really promote skill and comfortable using the tool. Uh, the special integration, uh, uh, creating uh, or using both the measure but also the technology, we really need to overcome the technical barrier that we are uh, people are uh, experiences. And I think promoting literacy can also help. I'm thinking about the experience of uh, of literacy about privacy, for example, but also literacy in, in the use of technology. Um, so I think overall we can see that. The Lab was considered as a user-friendly measure-based tool that uh, provide recovery. It really improved the ability of communicating between a provider and, uh, and patient. It's an effective way of monitoring the uh, recovery journey, but also like a way for a patient, as I said, the empowering piece of self-assessment and activation to really take control. So I like to think it's a client-centered care approach. Um, and we can see in connection that it may be more effective if it's, this intervention is in a team and in, 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 a, uh, in, in a clinic that is recovery oriented. So there is a possibility to work on all of those different dimensions of life. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Manuela. All right, so uh, still on Dialogue Plus in terms of the scores, uh, so the two domains, as I had mentioned, that uh, were always among the three lowest uh, for the three groups of clients were professional situation and physical health. About half uh, would have liked help in that domain. So uh, on prof the professional situation, there is what would seem a pretty obvious way to uh, to respond to that need, and that's to increase access to an evidence-based practice called in English individual placement and support, which in French is also uh, often referred to in the province as EPS. Accès au soutien employé EPS, which exists at the Douglas, has existed since 2001, uh, but is not yet uh, large enough that it can respond to the needs of all the people who might want it or benefit from it. Uh, other measures for physical health, I won't try to expand on that. Uh, we definitely saw a significant improvement uh, at the last measurement point compared to the first one for the scores that were lowest and which would have been worked on. But I think I do want to mention a limitation in all this, and that was that only a minority of clients uh, participated. Um, the context was one where you know, this was a research project offered to people who were, to, to case managers who were very busy. Some really took to it uh, and others were, had more difficulty or were less motivated to integrate it into their practice. So now back to PBMA. So I mentioned that Kind of a first step is to develop a, uh, a set of criteria and associated weights by which to evaluate investment or divestment proposals. So we started with a sort of generic set of criteria that Craig Mitten had sent us that had been developed for a cardiac unit. Um, so obviously we had to make some adjustments uh, and I must say the, the service user panel was quite helpful with that, though the stakeholder committee was also involved. Um, so just to illustrate the first three criteria. So the first one was access or capacity. So uh, I think you can read it here. So uh, it's somewhat formal language. Uh, so we're talking about optimization of capacity and existing resources to better answer the needs of the population in terms of uh, mental health, mental illness, uh, reorientation of existing services to reinforce capacity, uh, eliminate gaps or duplication in services, reduce congestion. So to assess this criterion, you have to think about the point of view of patients 
and concentrate on the impact on waiting times. And it's actually possible to specify waiting times for specific services. Uh, vendors impact uh, upstream on use of services. What's the net impact on of the change on future use of mental health services? So this criterion evaluates changes in use of services of mental health services beyond the first three years uh, that are beyond the implementation of the proposal. And then we have three, uh, actually four health and well-being criteria, criteria. We'll see them in a moment, all of them. The first one was on psychiatric symptoms. So impact of the proposal on psychiatric symptoms, including suicidality, impact of uh, on mental health measured over the long run, more than three years, uh, promotion of mental health, uh, accent put on impacts, long-term impacts on mental health and suicide. And you see also the scores here. So, uh, so the committee judged that this was really twice as important as these two other criteria. So these two together had the same weight as this one. So you see here the whole list of criteria that we developed. So you see, for example, I said health and well-being had been broken down into four subscales. So psychiatric symptoms, physical health, harm reduction for people who consume drugs or alcohol, quality of life, well-being, and recovery. We even had, uh, given the, 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 the planetary context we live in, a criterion of impact on the environment. This is, of course, more and more a concern in healthcare, but it was given a somewhat lower weight than others. You can see, too, that the, the total score here is 119. Uh, we were told near the end by uh, Craig Mitten and also another professor who works with them at UBC, François Dion, who was brought in because he speaks French, too, that ideally we would have had a total of 100. Uh, but anyway, I think the, the results are the same. Um, I mean, it, it works the same way. So you can see like work environment, partnerships, impact on research and kind of university development, which will be, of course, more relevant in some contexts than others. Uh, safety, number of people involved, uh, health disparities, alignment on the mandate of the um, of the the service. So and then for each of these uh these domains we have to score them so minus three means uh for the first the, the language will be a bit different for each of these 19 criteria uh, but for the access capacity one it goes like this negative impact on access capacity ranging to positive impact that's significant on access and capacity so the different services were asked to fill out a form uh, detailing their proposal. So the form looked like this. This was the first page. So title, who was the promoter, what unit, date. Was this an investment, disinvestment, or a revenue generating proposal? In our context, it really was hard to see what could have been a revenue generating proposal. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the leadership of the program uh, as a first step to introduce the methodology uh, suggested to everyone, OK, we're only going to propose investments uh, and we'll see if we can find the money to, uh, to, to fund your different proposals. Um, so that makes it a more comfortable way to, to start, though we're not exploiting fully the potential of the, the methodology. So then uh, detailed description of the proposal, what's proposed, why should we do this? So, uh, so what change in the service is proposed, why should we do this? What will be the impact on personnel, impact on the hospital, impact on patients, how? Then page two, we ask uh, 
uh, we asked the, the proposers to actually uh, assign themselves a score or assign their proposal a score from minus three to plus three and to justify it. Page three was like that. Um, we considered adding an additional criterion concerning alignment with data collected in the context of the MAPS project, but we did not do that in the end. Um, so there were, uh, those are the three key pages. There are additional pages that ask for what's the timeline for the project, how much would it cost to implement, what year, et cetera. But I won't take the time to look at that. So five investment proposals were submitted. One was to add an out, uh, uh, an occupational therapist on one of the inpatient units. Another one was to add a nurse to do uh, metabolic follow-ups for the outpatient, outpatients of the outpatient clinic, which of course are a big issue for people taking antipsychotics. Uh, another one was to add two IPS employment specialists for the the three CIV teams, which only had one at the time, which was really not enough to meet the demand. Another one was to establish a mobile intervention team, a uh, rapid response team for non-institutional residential settings. So the, the idea here was that the, the managers of these institutional, or rather non-institutional settings, typically don't have the necessarily the clinical skills to deal with crises. Uh, so they could just have a phone number to call, a team would come and help to resolve the crisis. And then another one was to organize occupational activities in uh, kind of forensic psychiatry, both for the inpatients and outpatients. So you see, I mean, there was some influence of the Dialogue Plus project because kind of at least most of the managers had seen the results that I showed you. So they could see like there's a real need in terms of kind of occupational, the occupational aspect uh, and the physical health aspect. So this is what the scores looked like. So we got initial scores and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna anonymize things here to some degree. Um, so we got initial scores uh, that looked like this. Uh, initially, I went over the scores and then submitted my revisions to the stakeholder committee. Uh, and at that point, Francois Dion was there too. Um, and, and we counter-proposed these scores, which in, some, in the case of one of the proposals was a lot lower um, and were generally a little lower. And then the service the, the service providers gave us a, yet another counter proposal. They looked at our comments. They gave us a counter proposal. And at that point, kind of, at that point, we we've stopped in the process. We could have uh, engaged in a more involved discussion with all the service providers. But to be honest, uh, several months elapsed between these two steps, and kind of, we just left it at that point. Um, so there's a there are two programs that did kind of if we if we take the second program's scores uh, at at face value that they would have ranked second. The number one program was very clearly number one. There was no doubt about that. And I will mention this one was uh, corresponded to uh, to the, the middle one here, adding two IPS agents for the CIV teams. So what are our provisional conclusions concerning this PBMA process? Well, it is a, uh, uh, a method that's been used in many settings. It has the benefit of being transparent and flexible in terms of evaluation criteria and weights. Whatever setting you may be from, you if you're managing a program with several budget holders, uh, it is possible to use this method. You can adapt the evaluation criteria and the weights according to what makes sense for, for you and your organization. There is admittedly a certain subjectivity in the evaluation of benefits and losses and, 
And you'll note here that uh, this program here, th they just said, well, look, you, you, I think it's quite subjective. I, I don't really want to engage with the process. So this is a bit of a, a difficulty. Um, we ended up not integrating the dialogue plus and PBMA approaches as well as had originally been anticipated. Um, it does require a certain investment of time and a certain commitment on the part of managers. It's more difficult to sell this investment proposal, to sell to, to managers the idea that, well, at the end of this process, your budget might be cut. Um, but nonetheless, this has been done many times. And, and I would say overall, the, the process has the potential to support a collective process of thinking uh, about organizational priorities. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult, but it can be done. So uh, I will stop here. There's a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, you see our email address is here. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Before we close, I also want to take a moment to thank all the case managers uh, who agreed to participate in the study and all the participants who probably are not online, but who agreed to try the experiment as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for your interest and participation. Thank you.